Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. What is up, my exchange family from all over the world? And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Chief Chat. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Kevin Osby, and I'm your senior enlisted advisor for the Army and Air Force Exchange Service. Before we get started with our guest today, I would like to introduce my lovely co-hosts, Nora Trillo and Kiana Holloman. How y'all doing, ladies? Good morning. Oh, so excited. We actually have history on our show today. That I mean, it's just, so, I don't know, can't get any better. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm reporting live from uh, Nellis Air Force Base, so I want to give a shout out to the team here at Nellis and Creech for, for hosting me and um if you guys hear the sound of freedom in the background, the Thunderbirds are certi certifying right now. So uh, I'll make sure that I go on mute a few times so you guys can actually hear the interview. So, uh, but like you said, we got a American legend today and I'm super excited about today's guest. So Kiana, without further ado, Kiana, please introduce today's guest. Today's guest is an American hero, a legend of course. So he is a renowned test pilot and astronaut who flew in the Gemini and Apollo space programs. He was the commander of the Apollo 10 mission and was the first to fly a lunar module into the moon's orbit, descending to nine miles above the lunar surface. He was also commander of the Apollo Soyuz test project flight, the first joint U.S.-Soviet space mission. Please give a warm Chief Chat welcome to retired Lieutenant General Tom Stafford. Hey. Good morning. It's great to be here. Absolutely, you. sirs. Also, I know, sir. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, we're super excited to have you on. Uh, can, you, can you let our viewers know where you're joining us from today? Uh, right now, I'm in my home state of Oklahoma, and I'm going out to my hometown, Weatherford, this afternoon with Colonel Lazarski and. Uh, We'll um, have a, you know, there's two things, a dedication of a portion of the library where I have a lot of my congressional testimony and documentation. Uh, will be there called the Stafford Archives. And then we have a wonderful airspace museum the city owns and operates, about 65,000 square feet. And TripAdvisor has given the museum a five-star gold rating for four years. It's right there on I-40. So about 40,000 cars a day pass it. And so it's always fun to, to be out there. And we have the highlights of lights. And, and all the rocket engines I've flown on. We have a real Titan too. And of course, a lot of the airplanes I've flown, like a 104, F-104, T-33, a MiG-21, and we do have a MiG-23 in there we're rehabbing, an F-86, so a T-38, I got a lot of time in that plane. So, uh, and, and we have a Wright Brothers flyer with Orville on it. We have a Wright Brothers glider with Wilbur on it, the Spirit of St. Louis with Charles Lindbergh standing up holding on to it. And, uh, and we have the real Gemini 6 spacecraft that are on loan from the Smithsonian that I did the first rendezvous in space and prove we could use that technique in going to the moon and using rendezvous around the moon, lunar orbit rendezvous, really saved us a lot of weight, uh, volume, money, time, and it's really sexy. So, well, anyway, that's what's in the museum. Oh, people, it's right there on Interstate 40. It so doesn't take any time to detail. Detour much. And uh, so if any ever get out there, please stop by. Oh, yeah, definitely. No, the museum sounds so exciting, sir. Um, and you just mentioned all of the awesome tidbits of history inside of the museum. So I guess we'd like to know what piqued your interest in aviation at such a young age? And when did you first know that you wanted to be a pilot? Oh, about the time when I was five years old, six. See, uh, my t hometown of Weatherford, 65 miles west of Oklahoma City, was uh, 
The main street was Old Highway 66, Route 66, which was the first nearly intercontinental road. It went from Chicago to Los Angeles, came down through St. Louis, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Main Street of Weatherford, Amarillo, Albuquerque, on west. So, but I know it's a little boy, five years old, six. This is 1935, 36. And every day, two or three of these, what I thought were giant silver airplanes, would uh, fly over. I'd look up at them and say, I want to do that. I've got to do that. So I've been motivated to fly ever since uh, oh, I was five, six years old. Wow, that that's amazing. Um, well, when you did become a test pilot in the 1950s, the rules for being a test pilot were still being written, so it was a lot more dangerous than it is now. What made you want to take such a risk, and did you have any close calls? Yeah, <laughs> I had a few close calls. But um, the, uh, uh, as a test pilot, you get to fly the latest things. So you get to go higher and faster. And so that's what I always wanted to do was to go higher and faster. In fact, I, I did achieve a uh, whole all-time record for speed with my crew of Apollo 10. We got came back from the moon in 42 hours. Normally it takes you 72, 78 hours to go out and free return trajectories we flew. And, but we had the fuel on board and everything. We could do it. And so we come, came back in 42 hours. So our speed was I think 24,791 miles an hour, or in Mach number, it's Mach 36. Or wow. you want to look at speed of light, it's 0. Uh, 0.0037% of the speed of light. So we were flat moving. So our crew held the record now. Unfortunately, my two crew members, Gene Cern and John Young, are no longer with us. So I guess I've inherited the title Fastest Man Alive. <laughs> Love that. Well, well, oh, yeah. No, and and it, and it seems like you, you like to take taking risks and, and those close calls. I think uh, my, my version of taking risks is driving uh, 85 miles an hour on I-20. So I, I don't think that compares to, to the speed that you were going, go, going uh, back back in the day. Uh, but you were you were among one of the first groups of astronauts selected for G the Gemini program, and the procedures. Huh? It, it, it feels like it was they were they were building the shuttle as as you guys were going along, right? And so, what were some of the challenges of early space flight that people might not even think of? Well. <clears throat> the whole thing, see, the Gemini program came out, uh, President Kennedy, let me put it this way, President Kennedy on May 25th, 1961, about uh, three weeks after Al Shepard flew his little suborbital flight, 110 miles in altitude and about 300 miles downrange, said uh, that's when he spoke to both houses of Congress and said in this decade, we set a goal that we're going to the moon, and, and I like the word safely returning a man. So, you know, that's higher and faster. So that really made me, you know, I always wanted to go to the test pilot school after I got flying jet airplanes, and that really made me want to go. So uh, I was an instructor in the test pilot school then. So I was very fortunate, and things were different then. I was current in eight different airplanes, and the an instructor pilot in four. So it, it was great. I was flying 80, 85 hours a month, or using an hour, hour, 15 minute mission instructing uh, people how to become a test pilot. And uh, so then also, co-writing to some couple of textbooks with some fellow instructors and, and teaching academic classes. So it was a great time. And, but I always wanted to fly ever since I could look up as a little boy and see those big silver airplanes, which happened to be DC-3s. 
or C-47s. Now, your career, gotcha. sir, has been so legendary so exciting and you were into aviation at a time where it was so new um especially when it comes to stem you really paved the way um in terms of technology and science when it comes to space your apollo 10 mission has been called a dress rehearsal for the moon landing so could you walk us through what was it like flying the lunar module snoopy so close to the moon well you know we uh started with Apollo 10, that was Earth orbit. And their crew, crew, Apollo 9, pardon me, they had a lunar module, command module, and I had 10. And I knew mine would go to the moon, and originally said, we hope you can land. But it was unfortunately just too heavy to land. And they were pulling weight out of it. And they did get weight out of the next one enough for Neil Armstrong, my good friend, to give it a try. But he landed with 17 seconds of fuel, which is not a lot of fuel. I wouldn't have had any seconds of fuel. So, but uh, the, the thing was very flimsy. We only flew with five pounds per square inch pressure, which was, uh, you know, was pure oxygen. But you're right up there by those thrusters, so the bang, 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 and that little thin skin thing would vibrate. Yeah, but also it was a real kick to fly down to nine miles above the moon. And what really amazed me is not only the, the huge craters, there you see Snoopy. And, uh, but the, uh, and there is after we staged, we came back up to finish the rendezvous. And if you look at that, I was on the, the left hand side. And as you look at it, and the, uh, but it was, uh, you well, know, saucers fired, it was just bang, bang. And like you had a, the kids, we used to put wash tubs over our head and they got hammered and beat on them, bang, bang. But that's the way those saucers sound. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, one of the real kids, go ahead. I'm sorry, sir, earlier, um we were going to ask you about your photograph that you kind of told us about a little bit earlier before we got, before we started the show. But for a, our viewers, can you tell us a little bit about that famous photograph you took of the Earth above the moon's horizon? Uh, maybe just tell us a little bit about taking that photo. Sure. <clears throat> the orbit around the Earth, the altitude we fly is 90 minutes. Around the moon is two hours. So right there on a the flight plane, you'd look, boom, here comes the Earth. And right there in real time, it's about the size of an orange. And there you see it, it's like a half an orange. And so the moon, is, the Earth is half eclipsed. And I shot that picture with a 70 millimeter Hasselblad. We also had uh, that color TV I pioneered. And we did that, and for that, we received an Emmy, which is in a museum here in Oklahoma. But we, I wanted to take them, the people that paid for that mission, the American public, I wanted to take them with me on that. And so the way I could take them with me is have a color TV. That's how we put it together. And uh, short order, I did. NASA had a program to do it in three years. I did it in about seven months. Wow. Yeah, well, you, you definitely take, took the world with you uh, as you orbited the moon. And um, I, it kind of takes me back to kind of what uh, I, I saw on TV the, a, a few months ago when uh, uh, Jeff Bezos and uh, I think another gentleman, they, they, they went into space for 10 seconds and came back down. Uh, and now they're going to try to start you know, doing doing uh, that on a recreational basis where people can pay to go into orbit for a split second and come back down. So, I, you know, just from what, what, what you did at that point in time to, you know, what we're doing right now, man, it's, uh, you, you're a trailblazer. Well, there's a difference. You see, he's only going up to around you know, 55 miles, 60. See, we're in orbit 160 miles. 
and we were doing 17,400 miles an hour, equivalent Mach number was 26, and Bezos may have gotten up to Mach three and a half, and I think his altitude it was just about 57 miles. That's what the FAI decided. 57 statue miles if you read your speedometer. And this is 50 nautical miles. And so, and also the reentry is, is really not much heat where we yes, really sir. heated up coming in from that time. Awesome. So a few, a few years after Apollo 10, you commanded the U.S. crew on the Apollo Soyuz test project. So this is the first U.S. Soviet space project. How important was that to happen during the Cold War? Well, it was rather unique, Chief. Uh, you know, everything over there, say, it's a Bolshoya secret. Everything's a big secret. <laughs> and uh, so we didn't really know much about it. But we kept pushing, he opened up. And, it was kind of unique to be with them, and you know, and we kept politics out of it completely. And here we are. They were professional test pilots, engineers. I had Deke Slayton there on my left, as you look at the screen, Vance Brand on the right. And both of them were, it was their first flight. I'd flown three flights before that. And all to the right is, is Leonov standing up and he became nearly like a brother to me. And I've gone hunting with him and fishing with him in the Soviet Union and later Russia. And he's been with me uh, shooting birds in Eastern Shore of Maryland and hunting. So we were just real close friends. In fact, uh, my uh, grandson is named after him and his granddaughter, Karin, K-A-R-I-N is named after my daughter, Karen. So it was really a great friendship we have had. Yes, sir. So your tremendous well, leadership. Kind of we had VIP treatment everywhere. Pardon me? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I was just saying your um, leadership abilities, your tremendous leadership played a humongous role in your success throughout your career, but also, as you just touched on, your relationships um, with other astronauts and scientists also played a huge role in um, just your legacy and that legacy of being a super amazing trailblazer. So could you tell us a bit more about your friendship with Alexei Leonov, the Soviet commander? Certainly, <clears throat> you know, neither country had worked together before. And so there were completely different approaches to ideas and issues. Our managers and engineers would take a different view than the Soviet. But anyway, Alexa and I would get together and work it out and said, hey, here's the way it's going to be. We just hit it off and friendship real easy. And so I nearly considered him like a brother to me. So same way. And I was hate to see him go and suffer from diabetes. And I got a call oh, about two, three weeks before he passed away. Said he wanted to see me. I uh, just got on a plane, a multi-entry visa, flew to Russia, and saw him in the hospital. Unfortunately, one of his arms, his, his elbow down had been cut off, his feet had been cut off one foot due to diabetes. And so he he, um, he was semi-conscious, so he always talked to me in English. So he opened it and says, Tom, I see your blue eyes. So he talked to me, and I, I kept talking to him in Russia, my best Russia I could, with an Oklahoma accent. <laughs> and uh, it what really got me and nearly made me cry. About the last thing I heard him say, he opened his eyes. And in Russian, he says, Tom, blue, blue tibia says, Tom, I love you, and shut his eyes and, his, and went back to sleep again. So his wife was there and all that. So we'd been there a couple of hours and left, and then he passed away. So uh, I, two days later, I uh, just got on the airplane again. They asked me to be a, give a eulogy at his state funeral, so which I did. And 
went to, flew to Moscow and landed the next morning. Next day, I gave a eulogy at his service and flew back the next day. So uh, it, it was a real groundbreaker. A lot of what we do on the space station today, everything is, was based on how we set the, the rules of operating together. And the space station has gone very successfully. And I'm still involved there because of my experience with the Soviets, the Russians. And uh, a lot of them set hours off and retired, rotated to industry and all that. They usually stay there with the government service. So, uh, the head and I was, in fact, I was the one that suggested we start using the Soyuz for the, there because the shuttle is a magnificent vehicle, but we just lost the Challenger. I said it's a wonderful vehicle, but it's a very fragile vehicle. Where the Soyuz was a simple but a very rugged vehicle that landed in mountains on hillsides, everything. And you try that in a shell, you just have pieces of metal scattered all. So uh, that idea that I pushed so so then, you know, one good idea kind of brings another, or one volunteer idea. So I had an answer, I said, okay, why don't you set up a committee to uh, for oversight, for safety and operational readiness? And I said, okay. So that was my volunteer work, and still today, 20 years later, I chair the committee. So I've got a great committee, and we have a Russian colleague's counterpart. In fact, we just had a, a Zoom call two weeks ago uh, for two mornings in a row about issues. And every Wednesday, I have a, the only one that gets paid is the technical assistant who is a retired astronaut, Colonel and Air Force, Kevin Ford, and, and he talks to his Russian counterpart every w Wednesday morning. So there's continued communication. That's great. So that I, it's really the nice. One good area we are working. I, sorry, sir, I was just jumping in to say, you know, we, it's so nice to hear that you're still giving back, even after um, you know our, our, you're doing all the the trailblazing and being a, um, one of the first ones um, doing this kind of work, and you're you're still giving back. Um, actually, I have a friend who worked on um, Apollo mission control room restoration project, so it's pretty neat down here in Houston that you can go in and and see the mission control room as it was back when when you were mm -hmm. flying. Um, but of course, you know you know, you're, you're, it's really nice to hear about the history and everything. Um, but what do you, um, what kind of future do you see for America's space program since you're still involved? Um, what do you think um, is in it in, in the future for, for the program? Well, it takes continuity by the executive, the chief executive, the president. And yeah, the, uh, you know, we went from flying uh, to the moon through Apollo 17, and then we had Skylab using residual hardware from Apollo. There are those three missions, I think, 28, 54, and 83 days. And then it was a space shuttle. And then for about 30 years, that's all we had was space shuttle. And we said, we need to do something besides that. And so that's when we started. Well, in between, President George H. W. Bush, Bush Sr., said uh, on the 20th anniversary of the first lunar landing that we should, you know, continue to finish the space station. And then, in the second, first decade of the 20th century, return to the moon. This time to say, and then in the second decade, perhaps an expedition to Mars, which is you know, a real challenge, tough engineering problem. And so we started down that way, but NASA did some studies. And they kind of dropped the ball, I guess you'd say. And um, anyway, I got a call from the vice president, said him and the president wanted to meet me. So when they call like that, I guess I better go meet them. Mm -hmm. And so they said, 
They wanted me to put together a committee to carry out what President Bush Sr. had called the Space Exploration Initiative, how to go back to the moon in a, room, in a method that is faster, safer, uh, less expensive, let's say. I don't want to say less cost, it costs a lot, but less expensive and really safer. So I put together this team and first, I volunteered about 60% of my time I had two floors over in Crystal City, that area between the Pentagon and Washington National Airport. And I had 150 people part-time in the RAND Corporation. Then gathered ideas from universities all over, industrial firms like Boeing, Lockheed, uh, Northrop, all of them came in with ideas. And so at the end of about 11 months, the vice president and I had a joint press conference. We unveiled his book called America at the Threshold. And uh, it's still the Bible on how you explore beyond lower exploration. Anyway, we were headed down that way. And then President Clinton gets elected. He said, hey, that was Bush's program. That's not my program to cancel. Boom. So for eight years, no exploration beyond low Earth orbit. So we lost eight years. Really, you lose more than that because it takes a while to build a team like this. And then uh, George W. Bush came along. At the end of his first term, he said we ought to re do some of the same things his father outlined. No, not to the same level of funding, but it would still be an exploration. And uh, what uh, we did that. And then President Obama comes in and he has different ideas and cancels that, so we lose another eight years. Uh, finally, uh, President Trump said we should do it. And we got started, now called the Artemis Program. And uh, President <coughs> Biden right now said that we should take the program on. So it's so like building an aircraft here. You can't build an aircraft carrier in one president's term. Hmm. It's, it's more than one. And so, same way with this, it's more than just one uh, administration. So, you, so the future, the answer to the question, I, I've spent a lot of time going to tell you, but the, the future, these are long term commitment programs. And right, uh, the Congress has to understand them fund them. You know, the administration president can ask for money, but only the Congress can appropriate money under the Constitution. So, but, the, but by and large, the Congress has been very bipartisan in this, very supportive throughout the years. So, awesome. if you can tell me what the chief executives want from another four or eight 12 years, I can tell you what kind of program we might have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not a Nostradamus. I can't, I can't forecast. Oh, yeah. Not, but you, you, know, you, you give some great points, and you're right. Continuity is the key. And uh, I kind of along those terms, a couple of years ago, or a few years ago, uh, we, we stood up the, the Space Force, and uh, you told us before that you, you live pretty close to uh, Patrick Space Force Base. Are you, you get a chance to get, get on there and uh, check out uh, uh, what the, what the what the guardians are doing? Well, I I I'm, I've met there a few of them just out of courtesy, and I'll tell you one thing: you've got a fantastic base exchange and commissary there. Like one time, I know I won the award for the best in the USAF, and a few years back, but really get a great service. And that's that's another thing about what APHIS does. It really makes the productivity of our airmen, our soldiers, now our Space Force members, very productive because then you have a break or at 4 o'clock you need to come back and work some more. There's things right there you can go pick up real easy and get back to work. So it's, it's really a tremendous thing for just productivity and the morale. So, and I, I, I'll tell you what you do at Patrick Space Force Base now. 
is just fantastic. Yes, sir. I got a chance to visit. And by the way, your, your check's in the mail, sir. You, you've you already plugged this, and we're going to have to send you a, a Atheist t-shirt and everything. So we appreciate, we appreciate the love that. and support. Absolutely. And uh, like I said, I, I got a chance to go to Patrick Air Force Base a few weeks ago, and you're right. They, they have a beautiful uh, setup down there, and uh, it's a beautiful area to begin with, right? So you got palm trees and, and water and, 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 and wonderful temperature uh, pretty consistently, and then to, on top of that, you got some pretty good stuff you can get uh, exchanged. So thank you for the plug. We appreciate that. <laughs> well, it's well-deserved, Chief. Awesome. So you're also pretty adventurous on Earth uh, as you are in space. So you got you you're known for your outdoor activities, and you kind of mentioned uh, hunting, having some hunting uh, with, with with your good friend from uh, from uh, from Russia. So can you, do you have any recent hunting stories you can tell us about? Well, <clears throat> the first time, you know, there were two of them. And here is Leonov in the Air Force. And all the fighter pilots are usually taught skeet shooting, you know, to develop lead angles and all that. And where his co-pilot, Larry Kubasov, was an engineer. He'd never had a gun in his hand. So we were, I had him down the first time in take him out in Texas during Apollo Soyuz. And we we're down in South Texas near the King Ranch hunting quail. And some were running on the ground. And Kubasov didn't know the rules. <laughs> okay. And so, bang, he started shooting at these quail on the ground. Sand must fly. Said, no, 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 no. The birds have got to fly. And so that was funny. But Alexei was a good shot. <laughs> Just not at quails, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> General Stafford, you have a captive. Pardon me? General Stafford, you have a captive audience watching us today. America's heroes are watching us live on Facebook. What would you like to say to them? Well, <clears throat> it's a great country. I just thank God that I had the opportunity to compete. The opportunity was there. In this country, if you work hard and stay at it um, success can be there and also when you do this you are just think about giving back to your success or passing on to other people well, that's that's great advice great advice so uh just pay it forward i, I always try to understand it, you know, it's a blessing that I even get to this position uh, where I'm at right now. And uh, I just really, really enjoy paying it forward. So thank you for that sound advice for our, our nation's heroes. Yeah, the, uh, I've been very fortunate after I retired from the Air Force, I started to serve on board of directors, of, you know, private co public companies. And over the years, it's been 40 years now, I've served on the board of uh, 14 companies, uh, that's been different ones, on the New York Exchange, one in America. And uh, so some of them had leverage matching grants you could give to charity. So, my, in fact, one time I was on board, three of the boards that had leverage matching grants. So the way you multiply it together, Chief, I get an eight to one ratio. So they have a, a state, regional state university at my hometown of Weatherford, Oklahoma. So set up a small foundation there. And I started each year I'd put the maximum in, I get eight to one. I also started donating to this little museum that the city built. It was, just, it was really a, a glass case, six foot glass case. It's now 65,000 square feet. And oh, for, wow. And so we have interns. So the students from my hometown high school that needed financial help to attend the university right there. And the airport the museum is only two miles from the university. So we worked it out where 
they can get, say, minimum wage plus it's light work, but they get to meet the public. You know, a lot of people go to college, they get to study, but they're not out in the real world here. These people get to meet the public, give tours, and everything. And so uh, I, I knew I'd put quite a few kids through school. I never kept track of it. But uh, we're having a big uh, event tomorrow where all of my congressional testimony I've had, some of the books I've co-authored, and written will be there. It's all the Stafford Archive of the University Library. And the um, uh, chairman of the endowment there said that I, the money will go on forever. I'm going to leave it something. But right now, I've helped put 165 students to the university. So let's help those kids through school. Uh, absolutely, that, that's a that's a legacy to be proud of. So we we appreciate uh, you know what you've done for this country and, and what you continue to do for this country. So thank you, sir. Yeah, I'm more than glad to just, just thank God I was born here in America, small small town, the edge of 2,500 people, the edge of the Dust Bowls. Now 13,000. Regional State University has about 6,000 students. And it's great. Well, thank you, sir. Um, you know, we, we are going to go. Well, we're on Facebook Live, as you know. So we do have um, a lot of people watching. Um, and I just wanted to kind of mention a couple of our viewer comments. And um, Sonia Davis, of course, was asking about what you think about what's happening with Space Force, which you shared. A, a little bit a, a while ago and we've also got um eliza joining you and saying she loves her country and does believe in passing it on just like you said um we've got a couple of people saying they're blessed for um you know being able to still hear your stories you know straight from you so so we really appreciate you coming on because um our viewers are watching and are grateful to to hear from you well, thank you. The, uh, uh, it's really great to have this opportunity, and you know I don't give that many interviews. And I, uh, I, I'm like my buddy Neil Armstrong, live a quiet life and do very few interviews. But when Colonel Lazarski <coughs> told me about this, and she, uh, the what APHIS does, just getting a plug for you, Chief. Yeah. Uh, right, there you go. I appreciate yeah. it, sir. <laughs> what the AFS does for the people in the Army, the Air Force, the Space Force, it's, it's really wonderful. So it's great to be able to relate uh, this career I had. I was very fortunate. In fact, uh, these, uh, the opportunities in America are there. you got to work hard. And like uh, I graduated. Uh, I, I, we didn't even have foreign language in this little town where I grew up. Well, maybe we did too, because I could speak English. I could speak Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and so you know, I went to the Naval Academy and, and worked, studied hard, and stood right near the top of my class. And uh, in the same way in the Air Force, I love the job. And I was very fortunate. First one of my class in the Naval Academy. The major flag officer won two or three stars. And so the opportunity awesome. there, all you got to do is just take, take charge of the opportunity and work hard. Yeah. And it's funny you say that, sir, because um, I, I had a meeting with my boss, uh, Mr. Tom Scholl, uh, the CEO of, of, of APHIS. And, and he, um, and he, he asked me about my chief chat. He's like, who are you interviewing today? I said, I'm interviewing General Stafford. And he's like, oh, my God, you're interviewing General Stafford. And so he said that uh, back back when he was, because I think when you flew your first test mission, he was a freshman at the West West Point Academy. But he said that he, he requested that NASA send them. Oh. He, he said you could send a message to NASA, and they will send you, like, pictures and or some type of uh, autographed pictures. So he... He said he had an autographed picture of, of you on his desk, uh, you know, when he was going through oh. the, the academy. But, and, but, but, he said, but he said that, you know, during Hurricane Sandy that 
uh, a lot of that stuff in his basement got destroyed and he thinks the picture was down there so he's still he's still trying to fish around trying to find that picture but he he's a he he loves you and he loves what you've done for the for the country and i told him that i give you i show him some love on the on this interview look i'll tell you what chief uh, to just talk with colonel ozarski his name and i'll make it i have a few spare nasa official photos make him out new one. Yes, yes. If you could, if you could send one, that would be amazing. Okay. What I'll do is I'll send it to Colonel Lazarski and let him take care of. It. Okay. Awesome. We'll we'll connect we'll connect those dots. So appreciate that. Uh, so, so, do you have any yeah. projects you can tell us? Do you have any uh, upcoming projects you can tell us about? I know you're in your hometown, uh, about to build the museum and do all that good stuff there. Uh, do you have anything else you're you're working on? No, that's, uh, um, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not on the board of the museum. I'm, I'm ex officio. I just keep donating money to it. Mm-hmm. City okay. owns and operates. <laughs> yes. We just had a big fundraiser and uh, we, uh, uh, and so now we're up to 65,000 square feet. We've got a gold star from TripAdvisor for five years, five star gold. And you'll see the highlights, the space flight. We have a self gallery. I mean, because of my experience with the Soviets and then my experience with being a commanding general of the flight test center, and the first experimental stealth airplane showed up, we test Area 51. I had the idea that we, you know, I knew how the Soviets operated and how we could negate it. And so that's what gave me the idea on the, the uh, F-117A, we called it Senior Trend. And that's, that's the plane that Colonel Ozarski flew. So we, I've asked him and he's graciously said he'd do that. Then we're going to have a mannequin of his flying suit, his G-suit and checklist. And I'll be right by this F-117A. And we'll get there put the, I think there's six of them will go to museums in the U.S. The rest of them are still flying red flag out of Dallas. So, so my oh, hobby yeah. is design. Uh, I'll think of ideas for the museum. And, and we, we're not as broad or as wide as the Smithsonian, but you can get near the, we have more mannequins in the Smithsonian. I always said you have to put you have an airplane, but it's the human that's there with the airplane. And we found this great mannequin maker. So we have uh, Wilbur Wright flying his 1902 the glider. We have Orville in a 1903 flyer. We have Charles Lindbergh standing up, holding by the strut of the Spirit of St. Louis. We have Glenn Curtis flying his pusher. And uh, so we have a pick. One of myself and Leonov with our suits right there on each side of the docking mechanism, backup docking mechanism. So we have all kinds of things. Man, that's, that's a lot of history. And uh, like I said, um, we, we're we super excited. Mm-hmm. And when, if I'm ever traveling through Oklahoma, I'm going to have to definitely stop through and, and check out that museum. I'm, I get more and more interested. As I get older, I get more and more interested about history. Uh, and, and just and, and now that I had a chance to get to know you a little bit better, I'm I'm, I'm really excited about it. So uh, we'll, we'll make sure we stop through and check it out. So, well, Chief, we have both aviation so, so, and space, sir. Oh, both. Okay, awesome, awesome. So I have to bring the family up, and and, and we'll we'll definitely go check it out. Right. And so uh, for our Chief Chat viewers, you can find this episode as well as past Chief Chat episodes on YouTube and Spotify. Uh, be sure to tune in on March the 15th at 1100 at Central Standard Time. We got Gene Simmons coming through uh, on the show. Uh, he's a co-founder of KISS and a Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. And also uh, w- tune in on March the 22nd when our guest will be Rock and Roll Hall of Famer uh, Felix Cavalier, the co-founder of the six, 60s hit maker, The Rascals. So, General Stafford, it's been an honor, a pleasure uh, meeting you today. You are an amazing American. Uh, just you telling the stories about uh, you 
kind of putting politics aside and, and developing a friendship with a, 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 a Russian that, that, that shares the same passion as you for, for space and, and uh, you know, developing that friendship. Uh, I think those stories are very important for our viewers to hear. Uh, and, and the great advice about paying it forward and just all the things you've done for 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 this country. So uh, I'm I'm like I said, I'm I'm indebted to, to you even giving us, you know, 45 minutes of your time. And we, we definitely appreciate you. Uh, and before we uh, before you sign off, I, if you don't mind staying staying on after after the live, I got I want to say kind of some formal goodbyes. But man, I, I just uh, I was excited about this interview, and I'm, I'm super excited that uh, you were you were able to kind of share, kind of walk us down memory lane a little bit, um, and, and we appreciate you. And you gave us an Aphis plug, like come on now, that, that's, <laughs> that's all on top of the present right there. Well, Chief, it's been great to talk to you on this interview, and it's the two wonderful ladies you have with you, and the staff members, and um, just keep up the good work. Absolutely. So, uh, yes, sir. Just, so just hang on. Uh, at, we're going to end the live here in a second and then we'll say our formal goodbye. So, but thank you so much. Appreciate you. Uh -huh.